So hi, I'm Steve Hayes, and I'm here to host a really exciting conversation on uh, symbolic uh, thought and communication from uh, you know, people who are very active uh, in this area on both sides of the conversation between evolution science and contextual behavioral science, which is the focus of the entire book that myself and David Sloan Wilson are editing. And so I would ask each of the uh, participants just to, to introduce yourself and just just a, a one minute or so, uh, not a detailed description, but what you bring to the table, what's of importance, how it links to your career and, and work to uh, be focused on this particular topic. And then I'll ask each team to summarize uh, their chapters for the book and we'll get right into the conversation. So in no particular order, uh, maybe perhaps the Ghent uh, team uh, could introduce themselves. Okay. Um, uh, my name is uh, Dharma Barnes Holmes, and um, I'm a professor of psychology at New Ghent University or Univers Ghent University. Um, we only moved here about two years ago, less than two years ago, having spent most of our careers or my career in Ireland, <laughs> at both universities in Ireland. Uh, I spent most of my career working in on. Uh, relational frame theory from the uh, point at which I read the first chapter, which was a preprint at the time written by Steve Hayes on relational frame theory. So practically all of my research activity one way or another has been oriented around that theory as a behavior analytic, contextual behavioral science uh, account of human language and cognition that is self-consciously post-Skinnerian. Um, and attempts to deal with many of the limitations of earlier behavioral accounts. Um, uh, we have, are in Belgium now, in Ghent University, because we received a large grant to um, further the, I suppose, current standing relational frame theory, and particularly its application in clinical settings. Uh, and that has involved working um, almost uh, without a break because the grant allows us to, to not have to teach or do any administration for five years, uh, almost exclusively in racial frame theory and connected more clearly with clinical issues, or clinical issues. But it is ultimately a theory of language and cognition, which should speak to um, uh, a base, an, an attempt to basic science terms to understand language and cognition from a behavioral and uh, contextual behavioral point of view, but also um, uh, as a, a theory that should have immediate, immediate applied significance. So that's why we're here in Ghent. And well, to the left and right of me, the other co authors of the. And I think if you could both introduce yourselves as well. Okay, so uh, I'm Yvonne Barnes-Holmes. I'm obviously married to Dermot Barnes-Holmes. Um, I've spent all my career um, in relational frame theory. Um, early on, uh, most of my work, including my PhD, was on the development um, of those uh, patterns or skills of relational responding in young, typically developing children and how they can be used to understand atypical development in populations with language deficits, et cetera. Um, I'm also uh, an acceptance and commitment uh, therapist and have, uh, ha, you know, engage in ongoing clinical work and supervision. And really, I think the latter few years of my career have been less focused on develop, development and more focused on the relationship between the basic concepts in relational frame theory and how they need to be um, enhanced or added to or improved um, in order to get us closer to um, a bottom-up behavioral or contextual behavioral science understanding of psychological problems across the board and um, how that understanding can influence the way um, intervention or changing the clinical behavior actually happens. Awesome. And I, I'm Kira McIntyre, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at Ghent University. And I followed Yvonne and Dermot over to Ghent. Um, so I originally did my PhD in Maynooth um, under Yvonne's supervision. 
And my primary interest at the time started as a, a clinical interest, but became more and more RFT focused. So I have the same aims here in again, because I'm on a dermat. So I can't really differ from that. All right, I guess turn. it's my turn. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm Terence Deacon. I'm a professor of biological anthropology, cognitive science, and neuroscience uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, I did my graduate work at Harvard. Uh, in fact, uh, some of it can be traced to my work uh, as a graduate student when I took a course from Noam Chomsky and Jerry Fodor on the philosophy of language um, and um, realized that I had a probably diametrically opposed view. Uh, as a biologist and then trained in neurology as well, I focused my PhD work in trying to identify the differences in human brain structure uh, that distinguished us from other primates and made language possible. I can't say I solved that problem. Obviously, it was a very difficult problem. Um, and as a result, um, what I was able to show was that um, there were no absolutely novel structures or connections that I could find in uh, making comparison between human brains and non-human brains that had to do with language. And in fact, I think it's become more and more clear that what's happened is structures that have been around in primate brains since their beginnings have been re-recruited uh, for their language functions. And they probably haven't lost their original functions either, but uh, it's a totally novel recruitment process. And that became the focus of my interests and led to a book in 1997 called The Symbolic Species, where I tried to make sense of those findings, both neurologically, or I should say in three different contexts, neurologically, semiotically, uh, and evolutionarily. Uh, semiotically, I realized that if this was going to involve structures and functions that had pre-existed language and were recruited to this new function. Um, I sort of had to understand um, communication and brain function prior to language, non-linguistic. I think one of the real challenges in the field is that we have been overly linguistic in our thinking. We're not realizing that the, the brain itself is not specifically linguistic, not specifically um, indexical or iconic in its communication, but it, it has its own sort of logic. So try to marry the logic of brain function uh, and particularly development, developing brain function with what language is really has vexed me all, all along. My recent work has begun to change my original ideas. Originally, I thought that the idea of universal grammar was silly. It made no biological sense to me, which is what really set me off in my arguments with Noam Chomsky and others uh, from that field. Um, I've come to believe that there is such a thing as universal grammar. Uh, and uh, my contribution to this conversation is to actually argue that uh, it arises in its structure, neither from nature nor from nurture and that we've ignored a third source, uh, which has to do with the constraints of reference using symbols, using ungrounded sign vehicles. Uh, and that that has actually created some of the special, special features of language, but it's also played a significant role in what parts of the brain were recruited for language. So that's a long story, but that's where I come from. Awesome, those are great uh, introductions. So, um... Perhaps, uh, Terry, you have the floor. Maybe I can, Terrence. Uh, do you prefer to be called Terrence or Terry? Uh, Terry, my friends call me Terry. If you're, you know, depends on whether you want to attack me or not. <laughs> then I'll definitely call you Terry. Um, yeah, uh, perhaps I could uh, ask you to uh, just continue in the way that you have and describe uh, your uh, chapter in just uh, five minutes or so, just the basic uh, arguments. And then we'll move over to the other team and then begin our conversation. All right. In the chapter I wrote, there's very little about brains, although that's been much of my research has been trying to understand what's different about human brains. Um, and that, that argument has been developed uh, really through the 1990s and into the, the 21st century and changed bits by bit uh, in which I've begun to recognize what kinds of changes make most difference. Uh, but the chapter I wrote is mostly focusing on this question that I just ended with, which is uh, what's the nature of 
the commonalities across languages. Uh, where do they come from? In the chapter, uh, I make a couple of different claims. Um, one is that we have to expand beyond our tendency to think that the only possible sources of structure are what you might call nature and nurture. That is cultural conventions set up by virtue of communication uh, and, and aspects having to do with uh, human psychology, human brain function, uh, and so on that, that evolved specifically for these purposes. Um, because in my research, I found it harder and harder to explain some of these commonalities um, from a neurological point of view. And I felt that, that in effect, um, they should be far more variable from a cultural point of view. Um, I began to go back to ideas that actually also began my research, which have to do with semiotic theories. And in my book, The Symbolic Species, I argue that one of the things that that we see in the development of symbolic communication is the ability to go beyond um, reference by correlation, indexicality, uh, or by similarity. Uh, the insight that I think that this led to for me was that when you begin to look at children's acquisition of language, um, what you see is a year at least of time in which they become better and better at communicating with their caretakers and with others, um, using pointing, gestures, eye movements, uh, and exchanges of a variety of kinds, in which they're learning all the constraints of iconic and indexical communication. That is learning uh, how to get joint attention working and so on. Now, uh, many people have claimed that this is um, what made language possible. Um, I actually think it's what constrains language. It's not necessarily a precursor. I think we can do it without specializations in these areas. And my interest in how chimpanzees have been trained uh, to do language-like tasks, which I don't think they have a tremendous capacity for, uh, but nevertheless show that it's not impossible with the right supports. Um, to get some aspects of symbolic communication going. But the argument I make in the paper is that um, grammar and syntax um, uh, produce what a, a colleague of mine, Joanna um, Leonardi and I have, have called the symbol ungrounding problem. Uh, that is in order to use sign vehicles that don't carry clues, their reference, that is, don't have likenesses or correlations in any obvious sense to the reference. Um, you and in order to maintain the grounding to that reference, um, you have to put that grounding somewhere else. Now, that grounding, that is the linkage that brings a, co a communication to reference, um, is oftentimes outside of language, iconic and indexical, that is contextual cues of various kinds. Um, and the argument I make uh, in that paper is that um, there are a series of those clues that are brought into language from a pointing gesture, eye movement, um, and recognition of a common frames, as you might call it, uh, since I don't know the field that you've come from. Um, I would treat these as basically iconic frames, um, as recognizing categories of interaction and classes of interaction that frame things. Um, so my, my background from that would be to use um, something like Irving Goffman's notion of frame theory. Um, but that those are the iconic features and then the indexical and pointing features are critical. Uh, my argument is that grammar and syntax um, are strongly constrained uh, by iconic and indexical features. And the only way to put iconism and indexicality into a sign system in which there are no built-in um, intrinsic grounding features, no iconic and indexicality in the sounds that we make or the print that we have. The only way that they can be brought into it is in the relations between um, words, between sounds, uh, the combinatorial relations. But the combinations in order to respect iconic and indexical features um, are highly constrained. And I have come to realize that a lot of those constraints 
um, are not rules or licensing sort of built into our, our psychology in some sort of automatic inherited way, but in fact are constraints on uh, communication themselves. We can only communicate symbolically with certain kinds of combinatorial constraints that come from the problem of maintaining reference. And so the argument I, I make ultimately is that grammar and syntax um, do have universal features, um, that they're the result of incorporating uh, very strict iconic and indexical constraints into um, language combinatorial operations. Uh, so that's the argument I'm making. And it's, it's a radical departure, I think, from both the sort of innate linguistics perspective that, that has rules and licensing and so on determining grammar and syntax. But it's also uh, a departure from the idea that these rules are just social conventions. That they come as a result of communicational constraint alone, um, of turn taking, of um, just features that show up by virtue of some sort of cultural agreement. And it's one of the reasons why I begin the paper by talking about convention and the recognition that convention itself is a semiotic process, that you have to construct it semiotically. And if you can't construct it from symbols, from arbitrary sign vehicles, it has to be constructed from icons and indices in various ways. So that's the, the core logic of the paper. Awesome summary. Thank you for that. Could we turn now to the Ghent team and uh, however you want to uh, organize it among yourselves? Just this five or six minutes on uh, your chapter. Okay, uh, we've agreed that I will sort of function as the main <laughs> spokesperson for, for, for the team so that uh, we don't appear to be sort of ganging up on Terry or um, launching into a cacophony of voices. Um, so, with that said, uh, uh, um, I'd like to thank Terry for a very uh, useful summary of his paper. Um, I found it very compelling. And um, uh, there, there, there appears to me anyway to be considerable overlap between the position he's outlining and the position that we're coming from in RFT, very, but from very clearly different um, historical or intellectual backgrounds. Um, and the background we're coming from is, uh, I suppose, a clearly Skinnerian to begin with, um, or a behaviorist background. And our, that's why our chapter starts out with, sort of starts with the Skinner's first behavioral attempt to deal with human language. And as was widely recognized both inside and outside the discipline, it's very much a failed attempt. Seven. Um, and uh, I suppose it's the other extreme, or well, Skinner's always painted the other extreme of the nativist position that was espoused by Chomsky, that it was all learning and all open conditioning and so on, and you could explain virtually everything in that way. So uh, the chapter we, we wrote uh, works through that very briefly, explains why it doesn't work, and even Skinner himself started to reach for other concepts which connected with generativity, which was very much lacking in the early the early text and around behavior. Um, but again, no behavioral technical account of what that was. Um, however, then in, in the early 70s and into the 80s, uh, Murray Sidman uh, stumbled upon an effect which um, it was stimulus equivalence and began to provide, uh, if you like, a behavioral explanation for what we mean by symbolic relations. Up until this point, symbolic relations in behavioral psychology were simply synonymous with arbitrary relations. And I think that's close to what some, some of the things that Terry says in his, his chapter where you have a relationship between two things that bear no physical resemblance. You can't relate them on any form of, any, along any form of dimension, just as you can't relate the sound of a word to its actual object. So up until that point, that's all that was required to, to define a relation as symbolic in behavioral psychology. What Murray and his colleagues did was to stumble upon or discover that uh, you needed more than that. 
that you think for a, a so-called symbolic or arbitrary relation had to be generative or emergent and bidirectional. And so without going into the detail of how we worked through this, we found that even a very simple training protocol in which uh, a, a participant was trained to match uh, one arbitrary stimulus to another, if you then presented that, those two same stimuli, but in a reversed order, so going instead from A to B, from B to A, humans, including relatively young humans, up even down to around 18 months or thereabouts, could in principle demonstrate this effect, which simple effect referred to then as symmetry and then in RFT as mutual entailment. But across decades, literally decades of research, researchers have found in behavioral psychology that non-humans, even primates, with many years of language training or so-called language training, fail to demonstrate this very simple effect. And behavioral psychology of all the psychologies should be the one that should clearly be able to do this. First of all, we had an investment in it. A lot of behavioral psychology was based on the assumption that the processes that you find in non-humans will readily be observed in humans and should maybe with no need to have a, an idea or a suggestion of separate types of processes. And also they should have the technical skills to produce these effects with relative ease because of their experience with working with non-humans. But even to this day, in even very recent reviews that I've read and articles that are, are literally impressed that, that I've reviewed for journals, there's still a failure to convincingly demonstrate even symmetry in any non-human species. And the ease with which humans show it is, is remarkable. And so in relation to, relation, uh, in, in terms of relational frame theory, relational frame theory has taken this core unit, what we might describe as symmetry or mutual entailment, and seen it or offered it as the most basic unit of human language and cognition that we, we know of. Uh, it's clearly defined, it can be clearly observed and produced in experimental preparation, and you can readily determine that it's observable uh, in this species, but not any others apart from humans. Now, in the original rendition in the, the chapter we've written, we note that the original, uh, in the original volume, seminal volume of relational brain theory written in 2001, we didn't speculate a great deal about the evolutionary history that gave rise to relational brain theory. There's a little bit in there, but it's not far from the centerpiece. More recently, Steve Hayes and others have argued that one of the important things that gives rise to the ability to mutually entail in the way that humans do is the uh, propensity towards cooperation in humans and cooperative acts involving things similar to the argument that um, I think Terry is making around a joint attention and social referencing and the fact that humans engage in what you might describe as non-verbal cooperation. Um, so even very young infants before they've acquired any sophisticated form of language will cooperate with caregivers in various ways by um, you know, picking up toys when parents are picking up toys, but not pick a toy up and put it away when somebody else enters a room and points at the toy and so on. So it's these embedded acts of cooperation that then serve to generate mutual entailment as a unit because you can both focus on the same thing. You get the sort of nonverbal perspective taking where if I'm looking at something and you're looking at it, I also know you're looking at it. So the ability for me to point at something, of you to point at something, allows me to point at you pointing at something and so on. So mutual entailment almost as a non-verbal act is built in to cooperation itself, which comes first. And then from that, um, those types of cooperative acts, uh, the ability to mutually entail emerges because if we can imagine you know, the early humans that if we can engage in that type of cooperation in, in, in prehistoric times, if you like, then all it takes is for the, the young humans to start or the humans to start to grunt at the same time they point and then to emit sounds that are specific to the object they're pointing to and then bidirectionality 
begins to fall out of that. So when I see uh, the object and I hear the sound, I start to hear the sound when I see the object and the symmetry is built in, in a way that doesn't emerge readily in non-human species because they're not engaged in this intensely cooperative act that, that uh, humans are. So that's the basic outline to the, the theory. Um, one thing I suppose I, I can say is that I, in general, we're now having just read our own chapter as well as the other chapters. Clearly, we have very, two very different disciplines, full of jargon, um, and I'm, you know, I struggle at times to follow exactly in places what Terry was saying. Not because it's badly written, but because I'm unfamiliar with the terms. And I'm sure Terry probably looked at some of the, you know, terms we were using and saying, what do they exactly mean? Um, uh, and uh, again, just lack of familiarity with the concepts. But from what I can see, there seems to be a broad agreement, um, uh, as I was looking at it, that, that, if you like, the truth lies some between, somewhere between the two extremes of this sort of extreme nativist position on the one hand, which is all pre-programmed and genetically laid down grammar. And on the other hand, it's all really stuff that, you know, it's just learned to, in a very traditional way through classical and opera and conditioning. That something unique happened in the evolution of human species that allows us to engage in relational framing and create the structures, uh, complex relational structures that we see as pivotal in more complex relational networks that we more closely associate with, say, grammar and syntax. But this is built out of... of the, the 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 core unit, if you like, of mutual entailment in the first instance, which falls out of these intense cooperative acts that humans um, evolve um, in their species specifically, but are you not unique to them? But there's a unique cluster of things that come together that allow relational framing or language and cognition, if you like, as a, a, a form of symbolic. You know, communication or form of symbolic communication to emerge in the human species. It appears to be largely there may be some limited forms of it in other species, but the complexity and generativity and power of language and relational framing, if you like, it seems to be unique to the human species. And there's virtually no evidence in over 30 years since relational frame theory is put in the deck by Steve to indicate otherwise at this point. No one has produced a a really clever ch chimpanzee, even after living it, with it for decades, that can readily engage in complex relational framing activities that we routinely see in even four or five roles, as far as we're aware. So I think that's um, a, a summary of the chapter. The only thing I suppose I would add to that is that maybe there are different meta-theoretical driving forces bet between the game we're playing and maybe the game that... Um, uh, uh, I think Terry is playing. Relational frame theory is much, very much built out of an attempt to build a theory of human language condition which has direct and immediate applied implications. You want it something you can use to you know, remediate language deficits where you find them in, in, in educational contexts, uh, to do clinical psychology more effectively and and, and, and um, uh, and the impact on the language that therapists use from or in uh, social settings than employment settings. So I think that's one of the reasons you see these very different language being, being played in the two sets of papers. So I think it's important to bear that in mind in the conversation that in RFT um, with, there's an overlap there but our truth criteria might be slightly different and our fundamental assumptions might be slightly different. There's an awful lot of overlap that I think would be. Maybe that would be a place that we could uh, start a conversation because you could imagine uh, differences in uh, analytic purpose could be complementary because you, it, there's a big range of things to deal with and you may want to focus on particular aspects or they could be uh, uh, contradictory that they could re reflect the deeper uh, differences in terms of truth criteria, analytic assumptions, and things of that kind. Um, and so I would maybe we could start at 35,000 feet and just ask 
what do we expect of a theory of symbolic thought and communication? And uh, perhaps a little bit of beginning to think about these two wings uh, are these differences that we see already in the conversation, differences in emphasis that could uh, be complementary, or are they differences in uh, assumptions that actually reflect deeper uh, 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 lack of overlap or, or incommensibility? Well, let me, let me respond a little bit, um, uh, because I think in one sense, um, we are dealing with two complementary aspects. Uh, and that mine is, you might say it's the, the within symbol relationship, the semantic relationship, and the between symbol relationship. It might be a simple way to describe that distinction. So what I focus on in the paper, though not in my work in general necessarily, um, is the between symbol relationships, the things that are called grammar and syntax. Um, and yet, in my book, The Symbolic Species, the title giving this away, it's all about what's unusual about symbols. Uh, and of course, I don't talk about uh, this mutual entailment relationship. Um, however, um, I, I am aware of uh, an, another, uh, you might say, tale of the same story, um, uh, which is goes by another name, which I suspect you're fully aware of, and I, I don't know enough of it to know the connections, uh, called stimulus equivalence. Basically, it's the same kind of argument. Uh, that is, um, a stimulus and its correlate, uh, each uh, sort of doubling tail. Uh, and, and one of the things that's happened in recent times is people have begun to look at stimulus equivalence uh, in fMRI studies, for example. And it's looking as though um, it takes a tremendous amount of prefrontal activity uh, to maintain it. That is, that's where it's originally driven. Um, and of course, the argument I make in the symbolic species uh, has to do with the significantly increased role of prefrontal cortex, both in general brain function, but I think also in language. Uh, that is, it's involved in particularly um, uh, combinatorial kinds of tasks that involve multiple possible associations and figuring out how to sort of sort them. My favorite example um, has to do with studies that were done with animals that were trained um, to stare at a focal point um, and then uh, a light was flashed uh, someplace peripherally and the task was to move your eyes in exactly the opposite direction. Uh, whereas normally the spontaneous tendency is to look towards the flash of light. Um, uh, it's very difficult to look in the opposite direction. And it turns out that prefrontal cortex, particularly what we call the frontal eye fields, are critical for this task. Um, and that what you can do is to show that you can actually sort of cool a part of prefrontal cortex that blocks that ability in other species. Now, what, what this is about, in, in a sense, in this particular case, it's about holding attention to multiple sites um, and then shifting that attention appropriately depending on a particular demand. Part of my work was to show that the prefrontal cortex has a kind of map that has to do with what I call orienting space. And the, re the way that I kind of worked this out was to look at its connections with an area in the midbrain called the superior colliculus, the deep superior colliculus, which is involved in orienting away from personal space. Um, and it turns out that that's the map. I was very interested in the fact that the prefrontal cortex doesn't have a stimulus map, doesn't have a motor map, but every place else in the cerebral cortex is mapped. Um, to find that there's an orienting map in the prefrontal cortex that actually plays a role in controlling and regulating um, the possible orientations that you could take towards a thing. Help me understand why prefrontal cortex is so much involved in combinatorial assessments of various kinds. And um, I think that's why it's involved in this stimulus equivalence effect. Um, so I think the stimulus equivalence effect is, um, or however you want to talk about it, mutual entailment, um, is critical. I think it plays a significant role. I don't think it's necessarily uh, what you might call the smoking gun that made it possible. 
I think that increasing our tendency towards stimulus equivalents has made it easier. Um, and I think that a lot of the so prefrontal enlargement is a result of incredible in selection driving this process. Uh, now, in terms of the therapeutic side of it, um, I also think that there's uh, the complementary sort of what I call combinatorial side of the problem. Um, I, I think particularly in the case of autism, one of the things that, that happens in early stages of detecting autism is that children are not focusing in on eye gaze or, or attention of other individuals, um, do not engage in these kinds of cooperative activities very well, and particularly have trouble with pointing um, and using pointing behavior and understanding pointing behavior. If that indexical constraint system that has to be learned in order to move towards the use of symbols uh, in a combinatorial way, the way we do with sentences, um, then you would expect that autistic children would have a terrific difficulty in getting into this. Um, and so what I see in these two approaches is a complementation uh, in which one side of the approach is focusing on um, how easily we acquire the symbolic relations, that is the correspondence relations, but the correspondence relations uh, being uh, relatively uncued um, can be now brought together with these combinatorial relations and damage in either of these capacities or inabilities of either of these capacities should make language acquisition difficult. But it should also um, be an avenue for talking about different kinds of difficulties and then therapies, therapies that could be used to sort of pull it forward. So uh, what I'm saying is I see these as very complementary to each other. And I'll stop with that. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, yes, I, I, um, I, the, the, the study of Stone's equivalence, is, uh, as um, we indicated, went back to the early work of Murray Sidman, who I think coined the phrase yeah. and so on. And it has been the source of um, many, many studies. I think one of the first fMRI studies were reported by a colleague of mine from a number of years ago, uh, David Dickens, who Yes. I did with colleagues in Liverpool on this and showed that when people were solving equivalent uh, problems or demonstrating equivalence, that the areas associated with language were more active during um, the uh, equivalence responding than during a, a control task. And indeed, we publish work using EEG and so on, showing that many of the, 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 the patterns that you see in um, things like priming, the N400 waveform and so on, are seen when you train and test for equivalence relations in laboratory settings. So there is considerable evidence, of mounting evidence, that the, um, if you like, the areas of the cortex associated with uh, symbolic relations in natural language um, are also um, involved when the human beings are uh, demonstrating equivalence relations in, uh, in 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 a scanner, or with uh, when wired up to EEG um, uh, recording equipment. I suppose one of the important distinctions that we're making now in RFT, though, is between mutual entailment and what we call combinatorial entailment. Um, that maybe I think hitherto we brushed over, particularly the equivalence literature, that appears to be the case. And there is developmental evidence. I think Steve's, one of Steve's early studies um, with Gene Lipkins in 19... Uh, correct me if I'm right, Steve, you probably know the study better than I do, um, that you see the emergence of uh, mutual entailment before you see the emergence of combinatorial entailment in the developmental trajectory of, I think it was Charlie at the time. <laughs> Uh, and I think we've seen broadly similar uh, um, findings in studies conducted since then. So in, in, in terms of evolutionary history, um, it would be difficult to get evidence to sort of to, to, to concrete evidence that, that that also emerged in that way. But certainly in terms of the developmental trajectory of, of uh, the development of relational framing or equivalence relations, um, symmetry or mutual entanglement appears to emerge uh, 
if only a matter of months before you see combinatorial entailment. Um, and so I think uh, it's certainly my own work uh, and the work the group are putting together now, we've, we've made a, a bigger deal out of separating mutual entailment from combinatorial entailment. In our early work, we just defined a frame as mutual entailment, combinatorial entailment, transformation and function, I think saw the frame as the fundamental unit. But now I think starting to emphasize mutual entailment as more of a fundamental unit. Uh, so, but I, again, I, 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 that doesn't mean I'm saying there's a difference here, but I think when we talk about stimulus equivalence, equivalence requires the three elements together. It requires that you combine two mutually entailed relations into a relation or a, a very small network that relates two mutually entailed relations into a combinatorial entailed relation. And I can see why that would certainly involve the uh, prefrontal cortex um, and require, uh, or at least drive the, the, the development of the prefrontal cortex in evolution terms to really start to, um, uh, I, I suppose, um, take full advantage of the ability to build increasingly complex combinatorial relations that give rise to increasingly complex forms of relations and relational networks or grammar and syntax and that can only happen once you get um, uh, neurophysiological structures that can can handle that kind of complexity and, re and from reading your own papers, like the recursive properties of language and so on but i think from a maybe an evolutionary point of view that that mutual entailment gets you some way towards very basic symbolic relations and not much more, and you probably get trapped there without, you know, evolution and cooperation seeing taking advantage of those. So, but again, uh, a lot of that is definitely certainly we put a great emphasis on separating symmetry from the combinatorial entailed relations that follow from it. But certainly everything else you were saying there, the idea that, or you know. Children with autism have difficulty because they, you know, they lack the um, shared eye gaze and the joint referencing and, and, and so and so uh, or, or, or joint attention and social social referencing. Or they have deficits in those areas that render a language deficit almost a, 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 a certain outcome or a certain consequence. Um, I don't know. Do, do we answer Steve's question? Let me, uh, let me restate it because I think we're getting closer to it. But um, uh, it, what do we expect of our theories? Like, uh, let's take the, the case of autism. You know, the idea that uh, stimulus equivalence is an example of relating and that, oh, it's, we're evolutionarily prepared to do it, it still requires training with, uh, within the history of the, the individual. And that so some of these accounts suggest how that training should go. Of course, it may not be a neurobiologically intact organism. You know, you, know, you never know when you're dealing with special populations and you have to, but still, I think it would be thought at least in normal populations, but even special populations over on the behavior analytic side, if you can't take the theory and walk people through it, if you can't remediate it, then there's something wrong with the theory. Um, it, could be that there's other things like structural problems and things of that kind. But, and I'm wondering, is that a, a complementary assumption? Because in mainstream uh, language accounts, very often it looks as though the purpose is un understanding whether or not you're able to do something with it. And so could we just focus on the one, that one aspect? You emphasized it even in the very beginning of talking how you're trying to link it to application. And uh, that shift of thinking of a of this as learned associations instead of its learned patterns of relating has led to a whole bunch of things that applied people can do on the RFT side. And do we expect that? Like Terry, do you expect that of your own theory that what you just said, what's in your chapter, if we could take that and let's say, take an autistic child where you see some deficits there and the things that you're pointing to and build a training program, would it bother you if it didn't lead to the outcomes that you were hoping for? Or would it encourage you if it did? What, what is the role of this issue of being able to use 
the uh, principles to change things. So I think there, there are two aspects of this to focus on. One is that I think there's no question that in autistic children, there's some neurological issues that we don't understand. And um, just as with trying to work with uh, you know, adult aphasia patients as, after sure. stroke, there's some things you just cannot um, bypass. You can get better. You can shift to secondary functional systems that can carry some of the load, but usually you can't go all the way. Um, and my guess is that's the case with autism as well, um, that there's some limitations to it. I, I often think that the complement to autism is Williams syndrome, where you see a lot of language features um, well-established and stimulus equivalents, turns out, it looks like, I think is well established in these people, but a, a lot of other cognitive capacities um, are really impaired. Um, so I actually like to look at the two of them, but uh, let me carry this to the, the next step of your question, which is, um, uh, what would this point to? Um, I've recently come across a TED talk of all things. I, do, I don't tend to be a, 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 an aficionado of that stuff. I don't follow it much and I've actually resisted doing it myself. Um, but there was a young Indian man um, who came up because he had an autistic family member who came up with a sort of a picture logic system to help them communicate linguistically. Um, I can't remember his name, uh, the details, perhaps one of, or many of you know of this work, um, but it's basically something that you can put on your cell phone um, that has icons and relationships to these icons that you can build. Um, and the icons are pictures of things um, so that stimulus equivalents would be quite relevant for these. Um, and the relations are indexical relations. And, and I was very much impressed by the fact that um, what was happening is that this technique, which is, um, I can't even remember the name of it, but I get, I, I'd be glad, glad to find it and dig it out and send it to you if it's unfamiliar, um, actually demonstrates that both of these aspects are crucial, that both of these aspects seem to be a problem and that if you supply them with these, these tricks, that we can do on computers and cell phones, uh, that autistic children can actually engage in things that look very linguistic in terms of what they're able to communicate. Uh, and that was very surprising to me. And it seemed to me that that's the kind of thing one would look for um, to help both of these arguments um, understand this particular disturbance of language. Um, but I think in general, it's, it's a useful way to think about language. One other thing that I'd be interested in um, focusing on in this, in this respect has to do with recent work that has come out of Berkeley this last year um, by uh, the, the Gallant Lab. Um, it's a paper, first author, Huth, H-U-T-H, um, in which they showed um, long segments of, of stories. Uh, and they, they tried to do a... Um, correlational analysis, uh, principal comp very complex principal components analysis that, that tried to identify what areas of the cerebral cortex were preferentially active associated with particular categories of speech. And they created um, a, an almost unbelievable map of the cerebral cortex with basically mosaics with words it shows that almost every area of the cerebral cortex plays a role in making these semantic associations. Um, very few areas of the cerebral cortex were not involved. And that includes areas that are, uh, we only consider sensory or motor, for example, not language areas per se. Um, and this widespread use of all kinds of cortical areas involved in what you might call the semantics of language. Um, also suggests that, that this is a really remarkable recruitment of the entire cerebral cortex in language and that we're sort of when we focus on these sort of local language areas, we're looking at only a small part of the picture. Um, each of these suggests a very different view of language than we have traditionally um, stepped into.
Is team opposite one to comment? One to comment. Uh, so first of all, I should ask if if these two features I just described to these two studies um, are familiar to you folks. Um, no, if they're no, not, not for the recent one, but I, I, I'm kind of aware of the idea that it's difficult. To some of the, the more recent evidence in neuroscience is indicating that it is becoming increasingly difficult to localize language things in certain areas and say this is responsible for semantics and this is responsible for exactly yeah and so that the the, the the more sophisticated ways of looking at brain activity are, are beginning to it um make things look even more complicated or complex in the world they, they, they're probably truly distributed throughout the cortex um yeah. and including language and it's not some small new area that evolved through some genetic mutation you know uh fairly recently in our history and this is where language happens and it doesn't happen anywhere else but i i, I must put, look that uh, uh, that that recent study up because i find it fascinating if you've got i will be glad to send the text yeah. for it. there's actually a wonderful video uh this was done by nature um uh, the journal Nature, a uh, wonderful video of this process as well. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable. Uh, colleagues of mine um, have done things that I wouldn't have thought possible uh, to make it happen. So I think it's worth looking at. Um, also, I think, uh, curiously, uh, and I'll try to provide this information to you because I think it would aid our conversation in the future, um, of this study from India. Uh, this just a very young man who just... Uh, just sort of guessed at a way to help his his autistic family members sort of well th there there have been pretty uh, well worked out programs with autistic uh, kids using pictograms uh, maybe that but and and uh, there's experimental evidence on both the strengths and weaknesses of that approach but uh dermot and team did you want to uh, yeah I, more? I think I suppose that when we think about uh, go back to the question about the extent to which your theory or your account should lead yeah. to um, uh, you know, not the promise of, but immediate evidence of, or relatively immediate immediate evidence of some practical gain uh, in one or more domains. I think the very units of analysis that we propose in relation frame theory are, are are built around that need or that 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 absolute essential philosophical need for prediction and influence, remediation, movement, and so on. That's not to say that you don't recognize there may be structural deficits and structural issues that cannot be resolved, but you start from the assumption that you have to come up with units of scientific analysis that specify the very variables that you need to manipulate to, in principle, uh, remediate deficits or uh, control for excesses or um, uh, construct uh, behaviors that don't yet exist or want to exist. So in the context of a, a relational frame theory, for instance, just to look at all often accounts, what are the variables you will work with? Well, we focus on in RFT, what's a core explanation? The whole idea of exemplar training. You need to provide many, many exa exemplars of the, the units of analysis you're going after. So it could be mutual entailment, it could be combinatorial entailment, and you need to bring those under various forms of contextual control. So with mutual entailment, you want to be able to show that young children teach them that they can um, relate to things as being the same, to things as being the opposite, to things as being different, to things, uh, things as being above and below, to the left, to the right of, and do it across various settings and so forth and do it to a level of fluidity or flexibility so that you can get it children to do it one way then bring in a cue that says do it the other way and they will do it the other way for you and so on and then build up to more complex relations under contextual control so your very units of analysis must specify what you need to do the variables you need to target to produce the behaviors you're defining as language or verbal now that whether or not they actually are really verbal in a in a linguistic sense is important but perhaps not right in the center of the center of the, the theory but you want the remediation you want the 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 the, the, the behaviors you're targeting with your theory 
when you when you treat them with your theory to show improvements then in what would broadly be described as language and cognition. If you don't get that, relational frame theory is not a theory of language and cognition. It's a, who knows what it is, but it becomes then a theory of irrelevant behavioral effects. But if it doesn't have some sort of impact on language and cognition, if you don't see improvements in language ability as, as measured by you know, standardized measures, as measured by IQ uh, measures, as measured by just teachers in the classroom saying, this child improved dramatically when you brought your program in and, and applied it. Or you don't see improvement in therapeutic impacts when somebody trained in a, in a, 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 a way of delivering therapy was uh, uh, trained in, in, in therapeutic discourse using relational frame theory. If you don't see those improvements, then your theory is not a theory of language and cognition. It's an abstract theory of something else, but not much use to you. And it's essentially not in the field of contextual behavioral science that your theories do that. They impact yeah. in a very immediate way and ways that are shown not just through anecdotes or, 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 you know, or claims, but demonstrated through systematic scientific analysis of what you've done has improved things above and beyond what's available. It's a tough test. It's the toughest test of all in one sense. Uh, because it's the one that says, go make a difference. And you have well, and th this links to something that's kind of in this volume. Uh, if you read all the chapters, you'll see it. Uh, because here you have two approaches that are specifically not mentalistic. They're evolutionarily oriented in the broadest sense, um, both within the lifetime of the individuals and uh, across uh, lifetimes. Uh, and yet they haven't been really speaking to each other particularly. I'd be surprised, Terry, if relational frame theory, with even that phrase, was very familiar uh, to you. Maybe it- Quite unfamiliar, actually. Ex exactly. And so here's this body of several hundred studies comporting very nicely with some of the basic work you're doing there, but the, the sort of the uh, archipelago nature of yes. these sort of unvisited islands, even within the same basic philosophical approach is, is remarkable. One of the things, the reason uh, David and I called it, uh, uh, you know, a reintegration is that if you back up early enough and you look at who are the mentors of the mentors of the mentors, that wasn't true. Uh, there's a deep connection. Uh, yes. You could follow it just by the intellectual histories of the people involved. And yet, it, it, so I, this idea uh, of um, using uh, application as, a, as, a, as just a reflection of some of the ways that these different islands in the archipelago have, have moved, did, um, I was kind of aiming to a question there, but just maybe to back up and, and think about why do you think that here you have accounts that are they're they're not nativistic they're not sort of simple-minded they're not reductionistic they're not mentalistic and yet they've existed uh, apart from each other and you see it over and over again you know as you read the book you'll no, you'll notice there uh, why do you think that uh, the evolutionarily oriented folks have not brought together I, this is going on too long i edited it out when you're doing the thing but uh, david uh, at some point uh, you know, started getting concerned about the fact, for example, that there's really not a robust applied evolution science. There's a few efforts, a few efforts, but it's not robust. And uh, it, asking himself, why is that? What, what, what do we expect of each other? Do we want to see that? So are there just general comments that you have just about the nature of the connection and disconnection in this area and what it might mean for us going forward, not just in this specific area, but as a group of uh, colleagues who have some obvious overlaps philosophically and theoretically. Is that too vague a question? Well, there's some, obviously some vague features, but, but let me just say that um, uh, part of it does have to do with this disciplinary uh, siloing that's yeah. gone on you know, over the course of history. Um, very few people in psychology uh, follow a lot of the recent developments in Evo Devo, evolutionary, yeah. psych, evolutionary theory. 
um, which have radically changed. So that people have, uh, I think that one of the challenges is outside of evolutionary theory, which is an incredibly rapidly changing and still a very contentious area, talking about the different processes. Um, uh, there really is um, so much of a difference in the sort of simple-minded neo-Darwinian perspective and the current perspective that's, that's really sort of driving a lot of interesting research that hasn't made it out of the discipline. And I would say the same thing was probably true from psychology moving back into evolutionary biology. Uh, my early efforts have always been to bring those together, but there's such huge areas of literature that one ultimately ends up specializing. Uh, the other feature is that in order to do something applied, you really need to have um, a, a fairly strong, uh, uh, medical is not the right word, but sort of biomedical understanding of substrates. Um, and evolution is about how these substrates change and how they're different. But we actually only have the ability to use extrapolation to find that out. So all of my work in the evolution of the brain has been comparing brains and then comparing the developmental processes that produce those differences in different species. And then asking the question, so what could make that difference in humans? Um, what developmental processes might be involved? Uh, that's indirect, very indirect. And as a result, um, it's hard to apply, particularly with respect to the nervous system. It's hard to actually go directly to say, okay, now I can use that for a therapeutic source. Uh, and I must say that, you know, my focus has not been therapeutic. My focus as an evolutionary biologist is to understand the process itself, to understand how brain development has produced brain differences in different species and how it might help explain us. And so I think that kind of, I wouldn't say necessary, but but hard to avoid island-like effect that you that you refer to is is difficult to overcome, and that's why conversations like this um, should not be just one-off. Yeah. Um, they have to continue, and we have to find ways. I would say we have to force them because it's hard to do it. We just don't have the time and the energy to not do it otherwise. Uh, let me say one other thing that I wanted to, I wanted to add to this. Um, and that is one of the areas that I think um, the perspective I presented um, might have, and I have no way but to guess at this, um, therapeutic relevance uh, has to do with what uh, was originally called by Noam and others, um, the poverty of the stimulus argument about grammar and systems. Uh, the poverty of the stimulus says that children just don't get the feedback they need to develop the rules, the generalities uh, that, are, that are grammar and syntax. What I argue is that, in fact, children get a lot of correction, but it's not about grammar and syntax specifically, it's about reference. It's about failure or ambiguity of reference. And that that's what all of early communication between parents and children and about, you know, children communicating with other children as they get older. You know, you've got to get the reference clear. And my argument there is that that um, usually fails because of this disconnection of what you might call the symbolic and the indexical aspects of language. Um, I don't know what you're pointing to with those words is sort of the, the way you might ask the reference question. And I, I think that's a, a relevant issue therapeutically uh, because it may well be that one needs to focus on that uh, under certain circumstances and to know when that's the problem. Um, uh, uh, so in part of my argument about autism, I think that may be a really crucial clue uh, as to how to get towards the autistic side of things because the indexical features are just simply not available to them and you need to sort of drive and make those powerful. Um, now, it's an entire speculation. I have no therapeutic background to say that. Um, but it's what I would say the predictions from this. The other set of predictions that I think fit both of our perspectives, and as I say, I think the perspectives are complementary, not competing, um, is what does this tell us about how we might have changed or might in the future change our attempts to teach symbolic communication to primates or to other species? Would we do it differently now that we know that they have a stimulus equivalence problem? Um, that is, would we actually come up with a training that would amp that part of it up? 
uh, would we come up with a training that would um, help us drive the combinatorial relations and the indexical features? Could we actually show major differences? Now, this is not therapeutic, but it has, it's a sort of correlation. Um, you might say the complementary kind of study that one would do to get at the therapeutic efficacy of these, of these approaches. I'll stop. It. Want, to, want to jump in? Jump in. Yeah. Uh, I, in fact, I mean, the, the, what uh, Terry has just suggested there is uh, there has been a, a, a there have been a, a, a number of studies, uh, not that many, but an increasing number in the behavioral literature that have attempted just that using exemplar training. One of the papers I reviewed recently by, I think it was by Okioli and Zentor, reviewed the literature on exactly that. Oh, it was a Mark Deli sorry, it was a Mark Delizio piece where he uh, reviewed the literature on exemplar training or attempts to use exemplar training to generate uh, derived relations in non-humans. And again, uh, uh, the results were largely negative. It doesn't, it just doesn't seem to, to work with non-human species. And it, which sits more readily, I think, with the idea that the, the, the even mutual entailment, the simplest unit is built or very much embedded in cooperative acts. So, but there's uh, there there there's a small number of studies looking at exemplar training with very young children. In oh, fact, yeah. your a team and Ivan is involved in some of that mm. earliest work, which see, which I don't know if that's really nailed yet. But it, my, my takeaway from that seemed to be, uh, if you didn't provide that kind of training to uh, children, they weren't going to spontaneously so uh, do it. So the cooperative history evolutionarily may have given rise to, to the capacity, mm. but within the lifetime of the children, they have, uh, do you think that, has that been settled? That, that basically you have to train uh, a symmetry as an operant in order to be able to get it, I mean, to say it that way. I think the evidence indicates that. I think, um, but of course, it's the sort of thing where you need more studies replicating and so on, but it, it's not so. You don't you don't see symmetry or mutual entailment in very young children. It's something that emerges around eighteen months at the earliest, and does seem to require, from what we can see, at least in more in relations other than equivalence, requires a matter. I think because it, it it emerges slightly later, you need that 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 history of train of exemplar training for particular types of frames, bring it under contextual control to see robust evidence for it. So it's not there present from birth. It's it's something that requires a history of cooperation with the species. And then it you, you need exemplar training within this lifetime. But, but, but there, some of the things that are in Terry's uh, chapter seems to me are actually kind of in the things that are being done. Take things like the traditional Skinnerian operas. They include a fair amount of these kind of indexical yeah. uh, relations that are directly trained. And uh, for example, if you, if you take uh, the recent evidence with, uh, with uh, Mark Dixon's protocol, mm -hmm. where he starts training these higher order derived relations, but only after mm -hmm. he trains a, you know, a robust uh, ability to respond more in, the, in, in these uh, non-arbitrary ways mm. that sort of form a foundation for it. In other words, I, I think this complementary nature of it might actually be farther along than it looks, yeah. uh, yeah. just yeah. the way we're speaking, because even as I sit here, I can think of several studies that would map onto what Terry is talking about mm. and onto the, what you're talking about in your chapter in a pretty, uh, pretty close way, way mm. uh, experimentally to seem to show that, yes, you, you have to train this and get that well established, and not just in autistic kids and things like that where you may have an underlying neurobiological deficits, but just in the normally developing child and how they learn. Can I, can I just that, add something? Yeah, I, I think definitely. one thing that we have seen, and there's a student of mine in Poland, Christina Pomorska's PhD is on this, that I think you can't separate exemplar training from context 
be and I think of uh, uh, you know, context. I think accounts for a, a, the contextual detail accounts for a lot of our success in this training, and I think connects to what Terry's saying. So it isn't just about dropping down exemplar training with the right stimuli because the stimuli become impoverished in the wrong context. So we have children, for example, typical and atypical, particularly atypicals, who can do entailment in one context and cannot, clearly cannot do it in another. So they can do it with one frame but can't do it. So you see these really highly controlling contextual features. So I think we used to talk about exemplar training, I think in a way that wasn't sensitive enough to context. And now we're seeing just how embedded that natural learning is and how richly embedded and inherently generalized the new training has to be. Because I mean, before it would have, it would have been odd to say, well, you'd have just said, well, they've cracked mutual entailment, they can probably do it across the board. No, Pomorska's evidence is very, very clear. It's, it's, it gives you a foot up, but it doesn't mean that once you've done mutual in one, in one frame, you're going to be able to get it in another. There's not as much momentum in the system as we thought there was. It's much more contextually dependent, yeah. even for typically developing children, and very much so. In fact, for the atypically developing children in her research, it's almost idiosyncratic. The connections with context are almost idiosyncratic. So you've got to do this very detailed analysis of mutual and combinatorial in particular frames in particular contexts. And then based on that analysis, you then have to create interventions accordingly. So I just I think what Terry Stuff does is alludes to context. There are many, and there are many of those features that we have now started to really adopt in the sort of post-exemplar training era of, of training relational repertoires with young children. Well, if you follow that out, it's, it seems possible that the behavioral community, because of its history of focusing on uh, you know, prediction and influence and dialing into the details of it, can almost be, come into a partnership with, with some of the things that uh, Terry and his colleagues are pointing to as kind of an experimental and extended arm, not just in application, but in testing these things in, in uh, experimental analysis uh, and, and then being able to look at the underlying, uh, at, at the effects that they have on the repertoire and including the neurobiological effects because the brain is a, is a plastic organ and it's responding to this kind of uh, training as well. You were going to say it, something, Terry. Yeah, I was going to add a couple of things. Number one, um, what we haven't talked about um, in terms of acquisition um, is the fact that different parts of the cerebral cortex and other parts of the brain are maturing at different rates. Uh, and one of the very last regions to fully mature is prefrontal cortex. Um, I think one of the reasons that stimulus equivalence or mutual entailment kinds of processes are very late to show up in comparison um, have to do, I think, with the fact that I think prefrontal cortex is very immature. One of my earliest studies as a graduate student was to look at the sort of the, the, the standard Piagetian tasks um, in terms of prefrontal uh, maturation and to recognize that what we're actually seeing in the early sensory motor tasks were, was actually the capacity to begin to do what we call transfer learning, to take a learning in one context and shift it to a new context by relational features as opposed to stimulus features. And of course, stimulus equivalence or whatever you want to call it is a relational feature. It's not just a stimulus feature. Uh, and uh, that turns out to be something that's also across species, uh, very, very poorly developed, even in, in primates like chimpanzees and gorillas. Um, uh, old work by Duane Romba uh, was able to show that they have very poor transfer learning abilities, but that there is is some increment as we move to species like primates from species, you know, like monkeys. And so, I mean, from monkeys to apes, for example, seems to be an advantage. And of course, children do it uh, by, you know, two years of age, children are great at this. They do transfer learning without difficulty. Uh, but again, they don't do it at a year of age. Um, and any more than they do the stimulus equivalent stuff easily at a year of age. So I think that one of the factors that we have to consider always also when we talk about development is it's not just experience. 
It's experience and then having a system capable of using that experience to do something, to acquire something. And that, that seems to be a really crucial issue. We're coming up on the end of our time, but my clock just uh, four minutes. And as I expected, we uh, stole our additional uh, time. That's happened with every team so far because people get excited and having fun and the clock becomes less important. Uh, but uh, perhaps there's time just for uh, literally a one minute kind of concluding comment of uh, what you saw just in the conversation and what you might uh, hope for going forward. Can I preface it by saying that one major difference between what we're talking about here is that the piece I wrote is speculative in the sense that um, it's a theoretical argument. It's an argument not based upon uh, volumes of, of research that I've done in a laboratory or even in my neuroscience work. This is outside of my own neuroscience and developmental work. Um, it's an attempt to answer a question that was raised maybe two generations ago now that I think about it. Um, and I think has been inappropriately answered because we had a limited perspective. This, it's only nature or nurture that could have done it um, or some combination of the two. My point in this paper is to say, no, we've got to open our eyes. There's, there's more options here. Um, and uh, so part of what I want to do, it's, it's in some sense almost a reaction to my own neurological focus is to say, no, it's not just a neurological problem. It's not just a cultural problem. It's not just an evolutionary problem. It's bigger than that. There's, it's neither nature nor nurture. There's a whole other realm we haven't paid attention to. Awesome. And again, team, you want to? Yep, I think, um, uh, I, I, I think I would echo Terry's uh, sentiments there in his last statement that, um, but in a general sense, uh, having read his his uh, his chapter, you can see that there seems to be a almost a coming together of of of, of um, research in that tradition and research and conclusions in the the behavioral tradition, the behavioral science tradition, in that it, thinking in terms of one or the other extreme is not. It is is not the way to go. I think it's all nature, it's all nurture, or it's all behaviorism is all tabula rasa, and it's the opposite from the from the uh, uh, the traditional, very traditional Chomsky and linguistic tradition that that blinds you to all sorts of possibilities that 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 um, are available if if you think in this more holistic way and say, okay, what 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 if we just put those assumptions aside and work. Uh, from from one of them, deal with questions without having to align yourself with one particular uh, perspective, if you like, and say, well, I'm going to hold on to my nurture perspective or my nature perspective, and I think that led to some talking past each other in in in, in the history of um, the, the disciplines trying to deal with language in a way that wasn't necessarily good for any of us, but. Um, I think what we're seeing here, and I certainly saw so many things I had, yes, uh, I, I mean, literally in front of me, uh, all I can see all over the manuscript from Terry is, I'm writing, yes, yes, RFT consistent, yes, yes, makes sense to me, all oh, that's very useful, oh, I didn't know that, that takes that would be, I'll use that in my lectures on RFT. So, you know, that, that, that I don't think there's any one big no in there that I've written where I say I fundamentally disagree. So I think that, that this has been a very useful question. Well, and I think uh, that's true in the whole volume. I think you're going to see a remarkable amount of overlap. And, and not just me too, but an opportunity in some differences to, to build uh, and support each other and, and move the ball down the, the field. And that is the end of our time. Hey, Terry, did you want to? Oh, so one of the questions that, that we haven't addressed that was really the reason I wrote this piece, um, and uh, it's just a, a way to sort of a non sequitur ending perhaps, <laughs> uh, but is to say, no, that my approach is not to say that the extremes are wrong, but to even assume that any combination of nature and nurture doesn't get at the whole issue. This is not a nature-nurture combination issue either, that there's actually a whole third realm that we've ignored, uh, what I call semiotic constraint. Um, 
and that we've ignored it because we've had this focus on the arbitrarity of symbols. And that we've ignored it because if it's arbitrary, it either has to come from, you know, built in, given in our brains, or that we had to create it by this conventional process, which we have not analyzed semiotically either. Um, that's the nature-nurture dichotomy. What I tried to say is, no, that there's actually a whole third realm that's relevant, what I call semiotic constraints. And that that's a whole unexplored territory. Um, and that's my interest is to get people to say, oh, yeah, it is an unexplored territory. Why didn't I think of that? Cool. Well, let's uh, see where the community takes uh, these opportunities. Can I just thank uh, the teams for a great uh, chapter and, uh, and and for a great conversation? It was a really enjoyable hour and a half. Thank you.